How do you scan metals? These are, you know, it's a commonly asked question. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jenny, and I'm a part of the education team at Medit. Nice to meet you, everyone. Today, we have Dr. Ahmad. Hey, guys. How are you doing? Everybody will be really fine. <laughs> I <Yeah>. hope so. <laughs> And um, Dr. Ahmad is doing his daily practice, everything with digital method and everything with digital device, especially with MediScanner. Thank you for being here, doctor. Thank you very much, Jenny. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. So let's talk about today's topic. It seems really interesting. The topic's name is Tricky Cases to Scan. Uh, and I found that there are so many registrants this time. That means awesome. there are so many people facing difficult situations when they are scanning. There's a lot of um, people with scanners out there, but I find, you know, many times, especially when I'm training my own associate dentists or mm -hmm. colleagues, there's often the same issues that arise. And I wanted to cover those in this webinar. Yes. Um, okay, then um, before we begin, I have an announcement. So... Maybe <laughs> don't go. <laughs> don't go. Don't <laughs> go. Next to me. Okay, I think it'll be okay. Okay, um, I have a short announcement about our medic clinic at beta version. So it's second beta version. Yeah, you can find new features here. So you can save your printer and set the parameter settings and directly print it with Sprint Ray. Once you register a printer, you, you'll be able to find an icon at the right corner of the display. And with one click, the processes will be printed. And you also can manage the presets and new kit libraries are added. And you can find these features on our YouTube channel. And yeah. And there are many improvements you can find here. Yeah, above. So I have highlighted new, very important improvements. So half hatch alignment is now available. You can set the connectors manually, just moving some points. And a sharp wax knife has been added. So you can create not only the main group, but also the secondary groups as well. And this feature is amazing, the last one. So that is, as you know, that MediScanner can acquire dynamic occlusion data, and now it can be adapted to crowns. That means all the eccentric movement of mandibular jaw can be applied to the crown, then all the early interference area can be deleted at the design stage. And again, this is free app, so you can try it out, and please give us some feedback later on. Okay, have you ever tried this, Amat? I've had a play with it actually. Uh, the the new um dynamic occlusion. I've tried dynamic occlusion with the scanners themselves, which is fantastic. And I uh, started using it with the uh, clinic head, and it's a definitely a great way that it, the whole workflow can be done all with the same scanner and software. So it's really cool. Hmm. So this uh, CAD beta version has been just released last week. So you have tried so fast. I get the emails and I'm always oh, eager. I Once I get the emails, I'm always eager to see what the yeah. new releases are because uh, definitely super excited about Clinic CAD and what the company can do with it because I think there's a lot of opportunity there for sure. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so right after the lecture is done, we are going to have QA sessions. Yeah, you, we also have an official training platform and YouTube channel. So these webinars can be available on our YouTube channel and Medit Academy once it's completed. So, and if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us, MeditEdu at medit.com. Okay, um, that's all about it. Sure, we begin, doctor. Okay, let's jump into it. All right, guys, so a big welcome to the webinar today. Uh, today's topic is Mastering Tricky Cases to Scan. And so what I really wanted to cover in the next 30 to 45 minutes is 
all the difficult scanning challenges that we may face as clinicians and some of the tips and tricks that I have to overcome them and so that you never have to reach out for that impression material ever again. You're always scanning and you never have to take a backup impression, never have to think about, oh, the scanner won't work in this circumstance. So as usual, guys, uh, some of you may have seen my other webinars, but if you haven't, it's nice to meet you. My name is Dr. Ahmed al Hassani. I'm a full-time dentist. I'm actually in my clinic now. It is 8 p.m. New Zealand time, but uh, I love to be here with you, and it's a great honor to be on the, on the webinar. So yeah, I, I work full-time. I'm a dentist, much like many of you listening, and I've been using Medit scanners since the days of i500 and um, use the i600 i700 i700 wireless and i've been heavily involved in digital dentistry for a long time some of you may have seen my other webinar so i will save you the long introduction that's about enough about me so jumping to the topic and just getting straight into it a lot of us will be in the situation where we have bought a scanner such as the meta i700 that you can see here and that's all well and good. I mean, these are selling like crazy. And, um, you know, you get the scanner and hopefully you bought it from a good distributor in the sense that what makes a good distributor is that they provide you good education and good support. With the right education and support, you should be able to use the scanner for pretty much every indication in dentistry. Here you can see a range of different... Um, scans and, and this is all the sort of stuff that we've done in the practice whether it's a single crown a full arch implants etc and and this is really where you want to get to where the scanner is used basically for every patient i've talked about the indications of scanning in my previous webinars and the reality is, is i use a scanner for everything in dentistry the only thing i don't use a scanner for the only time i have to pick up an impression material is if I really, really need a functional impression of a dentula site, but otherwise I'm using a scanner for everything. So many of you will be in this situation, you get a scanner and you're scanning and you're scanning and you're scanning, but you may run into some issues. And these issues may leave you feeling like this, you know, I've heard a lot of problems from clinicians as I've trained them over the years and also our own associates. I don't think I mentioned at the start, but here in Wellington, New Zealand, I'm part of a family practice and we own and operate over 35 dental chairs in, in our city. So why I mentioned that is I've seen a lot of the issues through firsthand our associates, even through my family members who are dentists who have issues with scanning. And, uh, and this is really what I wanted to cover today, all the little different issues, all the problems and how to overcome them. And so then becomes a question of what are the tricky cases in dentistry? What are the cases that you may have issues with? Most of us are very comfortable with scanning something like this. This is a, a single crown and by far the most common indication for a scanner, you know, a single crown in reality is the number one thing that is scanned in dentistry. I know there's a lot of Instagram dentistry out there and there's a lot of full arch cases and full mouth rehab and all on X. But this humble single crown is the reality. This is the bread and butter of dentistry. And I hope many of you are at the point where you can do this comfortably and confidently. So then becomes what about a case like this? And I feel like this is a nice stepping stone from to do bigger cases. So you have the full single crown and then what about a, a quadrant dentistry what about a quadrant of crowns or quadrant of restorations you know this can feel tricky to some clinicians and then later in the webinar i'll discuss my techniques to handle this and as you will note here there's some deep margins there from some old root canals with old uh, fillings that needed to be removed and etc etc so how do you manage these deep margins any, any of you who are out there who may be looking at the scan may realize that there's retraction cord everywhere. Man, I am a big proponent of using retraction cord and any time you scan a, a, a tooth prep, any time you are doing this, you should be using retraction cord. 
then becomes metal scanning. Metal scanning is a very interesting thing where I think there's a lot of misconceptions about metal scanning. A lot of people think for some reason that you can't scan metal with a scanner or that it's very difficult. You know, when I put these sort of things on my Instagram, uh, a lot of clinicians ask me, you know, how are you scanning this? And, and this is also some of the stuff I want to cover. And of course, another tricky case, a classic case is the full edentulous scan, widely believed in the industry to be one of the hardest scans to take. And these are some of the things I will be covering in this webinar. So before we jump into how you do these things, I think we just need to refresh our minds a little bit. And we know in the literature and also anecdotally that, guys, the scanners work. Um, it is well established. Any scanner, any modern scanner these days is basically accurate enough. We've reached some technological plateau and whether it's the i700, i600 and, and realistically even the i500 is quite good even to this day. The reality is the scanners and the technology is not the problem. The literature has shown time and time again operator error is the issue. Operator error is where, where we have issues with scanners, where we have issues with, with accuracy. And so we know the operator is the biggest cause of errors. And so how do we fix this? How do we minimize errors in scanning? How do we troubleshoot these, these hard to scan cases? And again, it just comes down to scan strategy. I mean, fundamentally, it's how you tackle the case. And scan strategy is something that I've covered in, in previous webinars. So I won't go into it in, in, in a lot of detail in this webinar. But my friends, you really, really need to accept the fact that although the technology is amazing, you must use some sort of strategy when you're scanning. You have to. There's just no way around it. And so for a full arch scan, if we just briefly go over the, the classic scan strategy, you start at the occlusal of the terminal molars. You know, if you're going to be starting at the buccal or the lingual and, and you're quite, um, you know, erratic with your scanning, you are more likely to include and involve more and more inaccuracies in your scan. So something like this, you start on the occlusal and you go across the arch. And one thing I really want to make clear is as you go over the incisal edges of the anterior teeth, a very common error that occurs is double imaging or double stitching of images. And you will see this as a double incisal edge. And the most simple way to avoid this is when you go over the incisal edge in your first pass in your scan strategy, it's to make sure that you capture the entire incisal edge. The reason why we get double images is often when we are scanning across the incisal edges, we are too far buccal or labial. It is or palatal sometimes. It's very common to have that issue. And so if you're watching the screen, I don't think you need to quite make such a squiggly motion. This is commonly shown in images of scan strategies, but you just need to make sure you've captured the entire incisal edge. And from that point, you rotate, you capture the buckle aspect, and you keep going. And I like to have about a 45 degree angle where half the, the scan window is on the occlusal where the scanner already knows, and the other half is on the buckle. If you would like to go 90 degrees straight to the buckle, that works too. But you need to make sure that while the scanner is stitching the images, it has something, some reference point from the previous images to stitch to. Then you obviously rotate all the way to the palatal and go to the other side. And that's all I will talk about scan strategy because I know many of you are already aware of this. And the same is done for the lowers. So... We know scan strategy, and as you can see in this video, this is exactly how it's done even for a crown. As you'll note while I'm scanning this crown live, I don't focus on the crown prep. A common mistake I see is people focus on the crown prep too much. If you noticed here, I do my occlusal scan, my buccal, and then my lingual. And I'll play this one more time for you. I do my occlusal scan, and I go across, across the occlusal, I rotate, buckle, and then lingual. And a common thing 
with uh, scanning these sort of cases is to make sure you are scanning the interproximal well. And this can be difficult, especially if you have very tilted molars, uh, large embrasure spaces. This can be very tricky and you may miss this area. So how do you combat all of that? You know, how do you go from doing a single crown to multiple crowns like this? This is a, a case I scanned with the Medit. And here in this case, you can see basically every type of tooth preparation. You've got a full coverage crown for that first premolar. And this was our old root canal tooth, an inlay, an onlay, and something, you know, these days you would call a crown lay. And even for a case like this, I cannot stress this enough, my friends, it is the same scan strategy. You would start on the occlusal, you would move all the way to the mesial, you would rotate around and around. It doesn't matter the difficulty of the case, it doesn't matter how many preps are there, you have to follow the same strategy. So how do you get the contact areas? I find a lot of clinicians struggle at this. And this is a little image that I like to show. Um, this is an exaggerated image. I know many of you will be thinking, you know, our patients don't just come with one jaw. They have two jaws and some of them have limited openings. So it's quite hard to do this. But you can get some form of, of raising the scanner like that. It may not be all the way like that. But this is a common thing that I do to capture the uh, contact areas in most cases. Now, failing that, what I also like to do is tackle it from this direction. So I will have the, the scanner almost at 90 degrees, and I will rotate the scanner in this direction. And this is something that can be done for almost every patient, because obviously the only thing in the way is the cheek, and you do have a lot of room to move. The other thing I want to make really clear about scanning these sort of things, especially the contact areas, which can be quite difficult for some people, is when you hold your scanner, and I funnily enough have a scanner here, when you hold your scanner, get used to wrist motions, okay? When you, you know, too many people when they're scanning, they're, they're too rigid. And, and when you're capturing these contact areas, it really is rotation of your wrist to capture these areas. The other thing, the really key thing is soft tissue retraction. We've talked about this in the past many times. But why I want to talk about it now is because a common tricky case that a lot of clinicians ask me about is deep preparations. Can a scanner be used for a deep preparation? And the easy answer is yes. I mean, these scanners, especially the Medit, I mean, you can actually change how far the depth of field is and I think the maximum is something around 20 25 millimeters and that's a very large depth of field I don't think as deep as your preparation is I don't think it's plus 20 millimeters you know if you are longer than 20 millimeters you probably have an issue now even a case like this you will notice this could be considered a, a slightly tricky case a common issue that people have is with terminal lower molars is this area here where the laser pointer is. This is a very common issue that people have with soft tissue that is overlapping the prep. And even in something like this, I mean, all I did was pack retraction cord. I always pack retraction cord any tooth preparation I do. And if when I pack retraction cord, the gum is still covering the tooth preparation, I will pack another retraction cord. And then if the tooth is still covered by gum, I will laser the area. As you can see, there's been some lasering uh, here. If I get the laser point out, you can see some, some charred gingival tissue. But a laser is not my, you know, first port of call and I don't need I really don't want any of you to think that you need to have a laser to do scanning or you have to use it every case because that's simply not the case 90% of the time I'm just packing retraction cord and that's more than enough and I think you know it's really important for many of you to realize most scanning issues can be dealt with by just controlling the soft tissue 
before you pick up your scanner, the preparation margins have to be clearly visible. And good retraction, I mean, many of you will have your own techniques. I know some prosthodontists in our region that swear by the retraction pace. They love it. And good for them, you know, good. If that's what you like, use that. There's no one way to do dentistry. For me personally, I just use a retraction cord for 90% of my cases, maybe 95%. And time and time again, you'll see me, if you follow my Instagram or my stories where I'm posting my cases, there's always retraction cord being packed. The other thing is to control all the liquids. And this becomes really, really important for deep preparations. And this goes hand in hand with deep preparations. The reason why deep preparations are so difficult, and as you can see here, this is quite a deep preparation. But I think many of you will appreciate that a scanner will have no issue scanning this. Because if I can take a photo of this, then a scanner will easily scan this. The issue with deep preparations is that there's so much bleeding, there's so much saliva, there's gum. And if you don't control any of that, you will have an incredibly hard time to scan. And it's not like an impression where you can just squirt impression material in there and hope for the best. So with controlling the liquids, that goes hand in hand with the retraction cord. I often find when I'm packing retraction cord, that commonly stops any bleeding, it stops any crevicular fluid from the area simply because of the pressure. And so if you're having bleeding, if you're having a lot of saliva, you need to control it. Saliva is simple, get your DA to help suction, help retract, and bleeding, hemostatic pellets, lasers, whatever you like. And I think this is the most critical part is that controlling the scan area is the most cru crucial part of any tricky cases. Any case you may think, look, that is difficult. It's a deep preparation. If you just take it step by step and, and control the liquids, control the gingiva, you will be just fine. A you know, scanner can literally scan anything these days. And this is an example of, of, a, of a case. This is a very deep preparation. It's a old root canal that had mesial decay. And so by the time I cleared all the decay here, you know, this was going quite deep. And I scanned this with the medit and I fabricated an in-house crown. And this is the x-ray. This is the x-ray of the in-house crown. And you can see these margins here, um, which are excellent. You can see how much deeper the mesial is compared to the distal. And again, I don't want anyone to think that a scanner cannot be used for deep preparations because it's simply untrue. It is a little bit more difficult because you need to spend the time managing the soft tissues, managing the bleeding, but this can all be done with local measures. You just have to take your time and do it properly. Then becomes the next thing, uh, which is full mouth rehab. If you're doing a full mouth rehab, how do you take a scan for that? And again, this is a, a uh, real-time scan video of me doing a full mouth rehab. And as you will notice, I'm doing the same scan strategy. You start on the occlusal, you go all the way around, then you scan the buckle, you rotate again, and then you scan the lingual. I am not distracted by the fact that there's a whole bunch of preparations there. And that is how you should deal with your scanning. You always follow a strategy. The other beautiful thing, you will see every single thing, every single tooth preparation has retraction cord. The beautiful thing about scanning is taking an impression of this is exceptionally difficult. Exceptionally difficult. You have to pull out each retraction cord and put light body into each preparation. And then you need to hope and pray that there is no air bubbles. Because if there is, you are in a world of hurt. Whereas with scanning, and let me play this video again, if there's any area where there's some bleeding that's gone over the preparation or not quite retracted perfectly, you can easily go back, clear that area up, and rescan. And one thing I want to bring up, which I get asked often, is... Do you keep the retraction cord in there? 
And yes, I always do. You should never be pulling out retraction cord to take your scans, ever. Because we're all dentists. We all know what happens when you pull out retraction cord. Take a moment to think what happens. Instantly, you will get bleeding. I don't care how healthy the gum is, you will get some bleeding. And bleeding is like the enemy of scanning. So always keep the retraction cord in there. And you need to pack your retraction cord properly so it is not flopping around. It is not over the preparations. You will notice where I'm scanning there, some of the retraction cord on the lingual aspect is not packed all the way. And that's fine as long as it's not in the way of the preparations. So part of knowing how to scan tricky cases is knowing how when your scan didn't go well. And I think this is a really key part of scanning tricky cases that you need to actually look at your scan and troubleshoot any issues that may arise. And so a common thing is these little air bubbles or concavities in a scan where the arrow is there. And I want you guys to take a moment to think what that could be caused by. And any of you who are looking at this image and can see all the red nearby, you will instantly know this is obviously bleeding. And so any liquid or blood will cause these sort of concavities in your scan if there's a bubble or something. And this obviously is a major issue for your preparation scan. If this is on your margin, your lab will accept that. But, you know, the, quietly, labs are all very, very frustrated with scans that they receive from dentists. You can ask your local lab, which percentage of scans do you think are very good in a week-to-week -week basis. And the issue is, is they get all this work and, and all these issues with the scans, but dentists are not locally controlling these problems. And of course, your lab will never ring you and tell you, you know, redo the scan. It's very rare to get that call from a lab. Oftentimes, dentists will just ask, please just process it and, and you know, fabricate the restoration as best as you can. Another issue to troubleshoot is something like that where you see the the white arrow and this is a little tag of tissue and this is covering the preparation now in this case you might be okay it doesn't look to be covering the preparation too much but there if there is a large piece of tissue covering the preparation all the way then that's when you're going to have issues and again dead preparations can be scanned you just need to manage the soft tissue so the, on the point of scanning the tooth preparation, one thing I want to mention is what is the most overlooked factor in scanning for restorations? I want you all to just to take a couple of moments to think about that. What do you think in day-to-day -day scanning, especially crown and bridge, you think is the most overlooked factor? I'll just give you a moment. You can pause the video if you want to have a think. But it's the preparation. That is the most important factor when you're actually scanning. Yes, your scanner is important, but doing the preparation right, getting clear margins, you know, getting margins that don't disappear when it's something that's like a deep preparation, margins that are smooth, margins that are retracted properly. This is really what's going to make your scanning very easy and help you manage the vast majority of, of tricky cases. Here's another example of a deep preparation. And when we scan it, you can see exceptionally clear margins. The lab will have no issue at all marginating this and giving you a perfect fitting crown. If I'm being pedantic, perhaps right there, I should have retracted the tissue a bit better. But apart from that, no issues at all. And then becomes the point of how do you get to this point? And as always, you must, you must practice. You must practice and, and it takes time and there's a learning curve. And thankfully, these days, the learning curve is a lot easier. Then we come to the topic of metals. How do you scan metals? These are, you know, it's a commonly asked question. How did I scan this? How did I scan this with the Meta I-700? You can see it's obviously a removable partial denture, cobalt chrome, so very shiny. And here's another example. This was actually a very shiny metal amalgam filling and a gold crown. And both of them were scanned very easily. And no, guys, I didn't use any 
pastes. I didn't use any scanning powders. I didn't use anything that's an adjunct to scanning. All I simply did when I am scanning, this is my tip for you if you're trying to scan metals and it's not working, is just change the angle of attack of your scan. Let's assume this is your tooth preparation. You're trying to scan the gold crown behind it. And you will find sometimes if you're right above the gold crown, the scanner may not capture it fully. And it's simple. Why this happens is that the light is reflecting from the gold crown straight into the mirror and almost overexposing the sensor that's inside the scanner. So how we control this is really straightforward, guys. Just change your angle of attack. You know, you would scan your preparation and then go back. Any metals, you just change the angle that you are scanning them from. Go from all different angles to try scan that and prevent as much light reflecting straight back into the scanner. And if you do this, I promise you, you shouldn't have any issues scanning any metal. I've scanned metal partial dentures. I've scanned gold crowns, even orthodontic patients. No issues at all. The only metals you will find very tricky to scan is wires for orthodontic patients. Those are tricky. But then again, I can't think of a single reason you would need to scan an orthodontic wire. All the brackets and everything like that get captured just fine. The other thing is on the topic of scanning is to use the software to help you with these tricky cases. And one example of this is with the Medit software, they have a metal scanning mode and you can see it blown up here. So if you are scanning metals and you're finding it difficult, you know, you need to learn the software and learn which tools it has to help make these tricky cases easier. And then edentulous scanning. Edentulous scanning is a, a commonly feared scan. And I think, again, it just comes down to scan strategy. And I will show you what a scan strategy is for an edentulous scan. This is something I have covered in previous webinars, so I don't want to keep repeating myself. But for an edentulous scan like a, a maxilla here, you always start in an area where there's a lot of reference points. And here, if you can see the laser pointer, it is obviously the rugae. This is a good area to start your scan. And from there, you will go down the tuberosities and just start building that tuberosity scan. One thing to realize, guys, is that scanning anything is easy as long as there's no movable tissues and the area is dry and not overly shiny. So if you're scanning something like this, you definitely want to make sure there's no external lights, just like when you're scanning uh, metals. You need to turn off your overhead lights. You don't need to turn off the clinic lights. That's a bit too much. But your overhead lights, your loop lights definitely need to be turned off. And I routinely turn them off for all scanning. Now, after you've done the tuberosity, you go down and you scan the palate. This should be the last thing to scan. And the palate, some people have issues scanning because they don't realize they need to move deeper into the palatal vault as they're moving side to side. You can't stay at the same vertical height. The only thing that's hard about scanning an edentulous site is the soft tissue management. And I would highly recommend if you're doing a lot of edentulous scanning, you invest into some really good soft tissue retractors. Uh, there's the ScanMate retractor, retractors. There's retractors by Lo Rousseau. Some really, really good soft tissue edentulous retractors because if you retract the soft tissue well, and I'm talking about the cheek, the tongue, I promise you guys, these are not hard scans to do. It is commonly feared, and frankly, it just comes down to soft tissue retraction. Then the bite registration as well as something that people kind of get confused about, especially with edentulous patients. How do I take a bite registration? It's really straightforward. You need some sort of wax rim or old dentures or something like that. There's no way around it. You can't just get the patient to hover in midair with an edentulous arch and take a bite. Okay, so if you have an old denture, the beautiful thing about the Meta software is it makes the workflow really easy. Here you can see a scan of a denture. 
and you always scan the denture from the inside because that is the less shiny side or the intaglio surface. And then you move towards the outside. And the really cool thing about the Medit software is that it gives you the workflow. You can see that it tells you to scan the edentulus and then the denture. And the software itself will actually join those. So then you scan the lower edentulus, the lower denture or wax rim or anything, any bite registration index, and then you scan the bite in the mouth. If it was the dentures, you would scan the denture bite. And lastly, implants. Implants are quite straightforward to scan these days. It's certainly much easier than, scan, than taking an impression of implants. And I think it's one of the um, best reasons to get into intraoral scanning because scanning for implants is probably the best ROI you will ever get. It takes literally five minutes and you charge your implant crown fee. So it's a pretty good hourly rate. So how does it work? For those of you who don't know, you unscrew your healing abutment and then you scan the emergence profile. So this is the healing abutment unscrewed and you will scan this. It's really important to scan this properly. So make sure it's dry. And it's really important to scan the contact areas because this is what the lab are going to use to design your crown. Then you put a scan body in and the alternative to that is to use an abutment, but these days, this is really the standard workflow. You really shouldn't be scanning abutments because it can be quite tricky to get the margin of the abutment, but you can if you want to. But for everyone else who just wants to do the standard workflow, you use a scan body. So you screw the scan body in. I highly suggest you take a PA at that point just to make sure, and then you scan the opposing and then you scan the bite. And it's all very straightforward. And the Medit software, as soon as you select an indication like implant, it will set up the, the scan strategy for you or the scan workflow. It will set it up so you have a, a, an emergence profile scan, a scan body scan. If you are doing a denture and you set up the, the lab form as a denture, or the case set up as a denture, it will give you all the little scan windows you need to do it properly. We can't talk about implants without talking about full arch. And in summary, guys, look, still to this day, the literature does not support the use of intraoral scanners for long span restorations. That's not to say you can't do it. This is obviously a scan of a full arch implant case. But what it is saying is that if you're thinking of going from that to final zirconia, you are playing with fire because there is a risk, a high risk, that you will not get a passive fit. So you can scan for large. It's not like you can't do it. You just need to get good at edentulous scanning. And again, with good retraction, that's easy. But what you need to make sure is that if you're going to scan for full arch, you either use a verification jig or photogrammetry or some of those special scan bodies that try to reduce the inaccuracies of full arch scans, like scan gauges by Nexus iOS. Um, some implant companies like Tridental are making their own scan bridges, so forth, so forth. So that's really the key. If you wanted to scan this and just go into a temporary um, restoration, you can totally do that. But what you will find is it will often have holes, large holes, and then you will do a direct reline in the mouth. Because even though scanners are exceptionally accurate, what we are finding is as you go across the arch, the accuracy goes less and less when scanning for implants. And even something that's lower than 50 microns can cause you issues with full arch implant scans. So you can scan for them, but I would highly suggest you do something like photogrammetry or use a verification jig, especially if you want to go from full arch scan to final. That's pretty much it, guys. And also just to summarize here, those of you who want to master scanning in digital dentistry, I run the Institute of Digital Dentistry and we have over 80 courses now on our online library and we cover all these topics in detail. 
Also, we go into CAD CAM a lot, how to design. We recently released a huge ExaCAD masterclass, which covers ExaCAD A to Z. So just know if you want to learn how to scan, if you want to learn digital dentistry, there are resources there out there for you. And they're online and also locally, I would explore all the different resources that are there for you, such as through your distribution network. So that's everything, guys. A big thank you for watching. And now I welcome any questions that uh, Jenny and the team at Medit have collected. Okay. Um, thank you for sharing all your tips with us, Doctor. So let's move on to Q&A session. Okay, so let's start. Question number one. Do you think number of the images captured infects the data accuracy? What do you think is the appropriate number of the images captured for half arch and full arch scan? That's a really good question. And I think yes and no. I mean, the thing to realize is that when you're scanning and the more images you are capturing, the scanner is just joining those images together. It's it's like a, the, the first scan image you take, every subsequent scan image is connected to that. So if you sit there on the same tooth and you're constantly scanning it, it is just layering more and more images. Now, whether or not that impacts accuracy, honestly, I think the software these days is so good that unless you do something like you're scanning the same area and then some blood goes on there or the tongue gets in the way or something like that, it really shouldn't impact accuracy. But the question is, why would you scan the same area over and over? Mm -hmm. I do see a lot of newcomers to scanning that, you know, it's like an ironing board. They keep going back and forth, scanning the same thing. And you really don't need to do that. Once it's scanned once, that's fine. And, you know, Logic would dictate if you're just scanning the same area over and over and over and the software is trying to keep adding these images on top of each other, it most probably can include some sort of inaccuracy. In terms of how many are the ideal images, look, I think it's just to do with time, to be honest. I, I have never counted the images and what's the ideal image, but I think if you're doing like a, a quadrant scan, you shouldn't take more than one minute. If you're taking two, three minutes and the images are going into the thousands, that's probably too much. And I think you need to refine your strategy just to make it better for yourself and for the patient. For a full arch scan, I think if you're beginning, two to three minutes is fine, four minutes even. But once you get experience, genuinely, you should be able to routinely do a full arch scan within 60 seconds routinely mm -hmm. and i think the the longer you take and the larger the scan images or the quantity of scan images the issue is is you're making the file quite large which mm -hmm. makes it quite annoying to save on the cloud upload so there's many reasons why you should try to be more efficient mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. next question second question when inserting a gingiva cord around the implant abutment, if the gingiva circus is too deep, the cord tends to slip down along the gingiva circus. In such case, how do you ensure a clear margin? That's what I was mentioning when I was talking about the implants is that really it's not an ideal workflow to try scan an implant abutment. Mm -hmm. If I was you and the implant abutment is quite subgingival, I wouldn't even be that confident or comfortable packing cord down there because mm -hmm. as many of you know, with an implant, there is no connective tissue fibers mm -hmm. directly attached to the implant. Mm -hmm. So if you are packing a lot of cord, you really risk damaging the soft tissue hemidesmosome connection and, and furthermore, in putting in bacteria around the implant. So I would be very cautious with packing cord around any implant. I think a much better workflow is to use a scan body. Um, mm -hmm. Simply take the abutment off, put a scan body in, and then scan that. You don't need any retraction cords. You don't need anything. To 
just play devil's advocate. If you really, really need to scan this abutment, you don't really have any other option. Use your standard ret retraction techniques, laser, retraction cord, etc. But again, around implants, I would be very, very careful. Mm. Okay. Okay. Um, question number three. How this can when adjacent teeth are severely crowded or having large average spaces? That's a great question. And again, something that I've seen a lot come up even in our own clinic. And I've had some really, really tricky cases where a six is removed or a first molar and the seven is severely measly tilted. And it becomes quite hard to get that, that contact, especially if you're trying to scan for a plate or something, or even an implant. Um, and my best advice is what I mentioned when we are talking about scanning and getting comfortable. I have my scanner here, just getting comfortable with rotation in the wrist when you're scanning. Mm -hmm. And if I have this model here, I can show what I mean is that if this is the rotated tooth, I would come from 90 degrees and rotate this direction. It takes some practice, but it really is just tackling that contact from all the different directions, not just from the occlusal and lifting the scanner up, but almost from the buckle and rotating the scanner measly and distally to try capture that region. Okay, thank you for sharing your tips. Okay, last question. Um, question number four, is it necessary to take pre-prepped tooth scan before cutting it out and scanning the prepped tooth? Can you go straight to the scanning the prepped tooth arch and opposing dentition? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I, I very seldom take a pre-op scan, to be honest. Um, most of the time, if you are preparing a tooth for a full coverage restoration, let's say a crown or a onlay, most of the time you either have a very large, ugly amalgam there, which you really don't want as a pre-op scan, because what is the purpose of the pre-op scan? It's to give you some data mm -hmm. to design the final restoration. That's really the purpose of it. And for most cases, for a single coverage tooth, most good CAD software these days, such as Clinic CAD, has library teeth. So library data or uses AI to design the crown. So you really don't need a pre-op scan. The only times where I would really take a pre-op scan is if I have a good wax up mm -hmm. or for whatever reason, the tooth is a very good anatomy and I want to keep it. Or more importantly, if the tooth is a is a um, abutment for a metal RPD. I would take a pre-op scan, but not of the tooth itself. I would do my preparation. I would scan that. And then I would fit the metal RPD on top of the preparation and take a pre-op scan of that, which is actually a post-op scan. Mm -hmm. Then the lab can use that scan to design the crown to fit the metal partial denture. So no, to answer your question, you don't need to take a pre-op scan for mm -hmm. every restoration. And I actually seldom do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Dr. Ahmad, just one question came up in my mind. So can I ask one? Please. The medic scanner has two light mode. One is blue light and the other one is white light. So I heard that white light is very helpful for the shiny surface scan. So have you ever tried the light? Yeah, I think, I mean, from my understanding, the blue and white light modes were a feature of the i500. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, back then when they first released it, it did help somewhat because it, it reduced reflection or however way it did. I personally think rather than rely solely on the light or the software, I think clinicians, when they're scanning metals, just need to angle the scanner in different ways. When they're targeting metals to scan, they just need to use different angulations, different uh, points of view for the scanner to scan that surface. Because whether it's white light, blue light, or any scanner on the market, I have scanned metal surfaces, metal RPDs, shiny crowns with all scanners, and they all can work without any powders or anything. Really, it just comes down to the operator 
and their technique to scan this surface. Mm -hmm. And I think if they believe they can scan the surface in the first place, they will find a way to do it. I think a lot of clinicians think that scanners mm -hmm. can't scan metals, so they just give up. But the blue and white light, I think, was a release of Medit I-500. And, and at the time, I believe it helped somewhat, but it just comes down to strategy. Mm, okay, thank you. My pleasure. Okay, mm, so that's all about it for today. You'll be able to watch this webinar on our YouTube channel and Medit Academy once it's completed. So we would appreciate your feedback. And if you have any questions, please send us an email to medit.edu and medit.com. Thank you for being here, Dr. Ahmad. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And as usual, it's a it's a huge honor and privilege to be on this webinar series. And I hope those of you who are listening uh, enjoyed the episode and uh, found it useful. Thanks a ton, guys, and, and have a good day or night. Thank you for being here, Dr. Bye. See ya. Thank you.